The Dharma, incomparably profound and exquisite, is rarely met with even in hundreds of thousands of millions of kalpas. We now can see it, hear it, accept and hold it. May we realize the true mind of the Tathagata. Today is the first day of this seven day sashin here in September at Mountain Gate in Northern New Mexico. We had one month off in August and otherwise uh, a seven day session each month. And we will continue that program as well. Life is short. There is much work to do for each one of us. It's an ongoing, what can I say? Uh, letting go really of, of all the self-involvement that we have been um, connecting with and, and, and uh, which has been driving us since time immemorial, basically. Even in this life, we come in in this life as tiny children and as our brain begins to develop, we also develop certain attitudes about ourselves. We develop attitudes about the world we're living in. Uh, and a lot of this is quite necessary in order to be able to function as a human being in this world culture. But some of it is a little bit skewed. You know, we have grown up in, in uh, circumstances where our caregivers have not been uh, as enlightened as perhaps they might have been, although that's, that's a tough thing for people to be. Uh, most parents, <laughs> I mean, no parent really gets a, a, uh, a manual, a user manual on, on kids. We have kids and, and we do the best we can. And if we're not uh, experienced in our own life in being honored and being uh, encouraged and being um, respected and so on, then we don't really get how to pass that on. And so some people um, grow up uh, passing that dysfunction on unfortunately, but the wonderful thing is that when, when, when we realize that there is something more to life than what is happening right now, and what our culture says is, is optimal in terms of how to be happy and how to be successful and how to be uh, recognized, then, then we come to a spiritual practice. Many of us come also out of pain, and, and I, I know that myself included and in, in many other people that come to Zen practice have a, a history of some level of trauma. And uh, it's, it is a place where we can begin to heal. Sometimes we need extra help. Uh, in my own case, I did many, many years of therapy and, and that made a difference. But the therapy combined with the Zen practice was especially effective. At any rate, uh, I, was, I was struck by the title of a book that I recently bought. It's called No Bad Parts. No Bad Parts. And it's written by a clinical psychologist who developed a system of working with people who, um, well, a whole range of, of challenges that we have. And uh, he devised a system called internal family systems ther uh, therapy and, and sort of separated out what he calls our parts, the parts that feel ashamed, the parts that feel angry, the parts that feel rejected, the parts that feel not good enough, the parts that feel um, whatever. And all of us as we're growing up, uh, develop these parts based on how we are treated. No bad parts. 
This is something really important to recognize because tiny children do the very best they can with the resources they can, with the lack of power that they have. Everybody else is so much bigger and more powerful and stronger and and um, it can be dangerous to, to resist. And for some people, uh, you just learn how to manage. Other people grow up in wonderful families and still somehow we get an idea that we're not good enough. And we develop behavior patterns that reflect that. Now the bottom line, which we can experience ourselves through Zen practice, through long-term deep Zen practice, is that these are accumulations of stories, that there is a reality that is that we are perfect. We are an amazing, expression, each unique in ourselves, of this ongoing, unfolding, ever-changing universe. Nothing solid, nothing fixed, which for many people is frightening. And I think that right now in this time of, of the COVID-19 pandemic, when there's so much going on, people are getting quite frightened about not having control because nobody has control over this thing. And actually, we don't normally have control over our lives in general. We can do the very best we can, uh, but there are sometimes things that happen that are out of our control. And in this case, there's a lot happening that is out of our control whether it is the potential for uh, coming down with COVID-19, whether we're exposed and now that they're discovering that even people who've been vaccinated can have breakthrough uh, events. I just saw today that uh, there has been a decision that everyone uh, over 65, 65 and older is, is uh, to be eligible for receiving a booster shot of the Pfizer vaccine, which is the one of the three vaccines that is uh, somewhat less effective than the others after long-term. At the same time, there are people that don't believe that vaccines are appropriate. Um, there are others that don't believe that they should have to have a a vaccination, there's all kinds of stuff going on over the internet and uh, people are uh, getting very invested in their feelings about it. I won't go into that, but that is only raising the level of stress. And it is coming out of an attempt to maintain control in a situation, in an era, in a life where we have no real control. At any moment, death could strike. Uh, one never knows. There was my brother, incredibly healthy, and a doctor himself. And seven years ago, he died of a cancer that turned out to be extremely virulent and had him dead six weeks after the end of his last chemo. Uh, despite the fact that he was in such excellent physical condition. Things happen. My youngest or my oldest great grandson is on the, the autism spectrum and not because of vaccination. He was a preemie. Uh, his mom almost lost him very, very early on. And so they pumped her full of steroids to keep him um, growing and developing. And they know that one of the side effects of that can be uh, a certain level of brain dysfunction. And that's what he has. He's a, a lovely, loving kid, but he's got a rough a road to hoe in this life. 
because of his, his inability to really grasp uh, the nature of social interactions, at least not at by age 10, he hasn't been able to. Uh, so we never know what's gonna happen. Rather than try to live in a cave, and, and here I, I think about this uh, children's cartoon, which is quite wonderful. Uh, it's called The Croods, C-R-O-O-D-S. It's about a cave-dwelling uh, ancient family, the father, mother, teenage daughter, uh, and younger kids. I don't remember how many, one or two. And um, the daughter being a teenager and being adventurous, and it's a time when kids uh, go out and, and, and work on becoming themselves, becoming independent. It's a rough time for parents often, unless they understand that this is a really important thing for kids to do, to find themselves and not necessarily to become carbon copies of their parents. And so this uh, young teenager goes out at night. Um, and of course, it's a very dangerous environment with saber-toothed tigers and all of that stuff. And of course, she meets a young guy her age <clears throat> and he has news that there's uh, his family was wiped out by a volcano. And he knows that this volcano is about to erupt again. And, and he is heading for uh, an area far away from the <coughs> volcano. And, and so um, he and the, and the girl his old age kind of connect. The father is freaked, needless to say. The father turns out to be extremely anxiety prone. And uh, at the sound of any, any, any strange sound, he grabs all the family members together and, and, and calls them into a huddle to um, hide. And in this case, uh, the girl's mom and the girl and the younger siblings are not quite as fearful as, as dad is. And so they decide to set forth. If they stay where they are, they're going to be killed. So they, say, they set out and dad um, kind of uh, goes every, every hidden way he can to try to avoid danger. And mom and teenage daughter and uh, the, the boyfriend by this time, uh, go straightforwardly in the open and, and successfully so. And I think dad in the end may or may not have learned something about courage. But what I'm getting at is that we, we can go through life fearful of change. Most people do, as a matter of fact. And yet, Change can be exhilarating. One Theravadan teacher many, many years ago in a, in a workshop said, uh, imagine you're going to be sitting in this wonderful comfy chair, it's deeply cushioned, oh my goodness, you sink into it and oh, it feels heavenly. And now fast forward, how would it feel if you were stuck in that chair for one, two, three, four, five, six hours without being able to get out of it, how pleasant would it be then? Change can make a difference. Back to this book title, No Bad Parts. The Buddha, when he had his awakening, commented enthusiastically on having discovered this innate perfection, this, this unique, perfect, all-embracing mind that we all are, that is liberated and true, and that all of us have it. So, as we grow up and we develop these various different habit patterns of coping with things, they were necessary coping mechanisms. 
they may have appeared dysfunctional. Um, for example, if we, we uh, you know, many, many of the women veterans that we've uh, encountered and, and had in our retreats, our special retreats for women veterans with PTSD, escaped into the military out of abusive families. And they felt that something was wrong with them because of the abuse. This is a natural assumption that a child makes when they're being uh, negatively treated or abusively treated by caregivers, by people who are bigger than they are. And they don't have a, a caregiver that is supportive and, and um, protective for them. They just assume that they're bad people and that that's why those things are happening to them. And often the perpetrators will reinforce that by saying, well, if you were better, I wouldn't have to do this to you or whatever. Um, so we grow up and we have these assumptions about ourselves and they're not pleasant, they're painful. We find ourselves getting angry, suddenly maybe even explosive, explosive uh, at, at situations. Usually that's because of a buildup of not ever having been in, able to, not having been in a position to safely express anger. And so it builds up as each new situation continues. These things come up in our sitting. This is why I'm bringing it up. Because in our Zazen, it's, it's like we're putting a microscope on ourselves. In a way we are, because we're opening our mind to increasing clarity. And in that process, seeing where we're caught. And that's essential in order to become free of those caught places. But it can also make us feel like we're becoming worse people than we were already. Shunryu Suzuki called th this kind of situation uh, when these, it's almost like we've got a magnifying glass on our, on our supposed defaults that he calls them mind weeds and says you can use them as manure for the for the practice. You can use them as fertilizer for the practice. Because when we go into them, and this has been my personal experience, when we allow ourselves to feel the energy of whatever the bad feeling is, it can dissolve. We can become free of it. If we don't, if we try to shove it under the carpet, deny it, um, then it just goes in the background and pulls our strings behind the scenes and, and causes us to act out on those unfelt, unexpressed feelings. We can work with these by allowing ourselves to tune in to the physical experience, to stay out of the story, because usually we try to avoid the physical experience, which is unpleasant, uh, by going into a story about it. And often that story goes around and around and around and around and becomes a fixed part of our identity. I'm this way, I'm that way. And many centuries ago, Lon Chempa, a Tibetan Buddhist master taught the same thing. And I, I keep saying that I'm going to memorize his words because they're so incredible. But basically it is about the same thing, to tune in immediately before you've gone upstairs into thoughts about it, to try to be in your body with that awful feeling. And of course, Sometimes it's, it's pretty hor horrible. I spent a year and a half 
working with going into the terror that I had buried in my uh, earlier years in order simply to survive. And uh, I would walk into it, um, the feeling in my body, and until it was just too much, and then I would back out. And then later I would, when it came up again, I would walk into it again. And each, each time I would get a few millimeters further in. And eventually after that long period of time, I suddenly realized that I wasn't terrified anymore. That if fear came up, because it was only at a level of fear by then, I, it was like a, um, a, a companion, a friend. It, wasn't, it had no bite to it. There was no danger in it. So there is this wonderful way of working with these things that through that, we begin to uncover this innate perfection that we are. The other thing I want to say about this is that we develop these compensating ways of dealing with situations that were untenable and, and we can assume there were bad people because we developed maybe not so nice ways of dealing with stuff. But the actuality is those negative behavior patterns served us. They kept us safe. They kept us from, from danger. They kept us in, in, uh, able to deal with situations that were untenable otherwise. So when they come up, when the feelings come up and the initial urge to condemn ourselves once more for having those feelings or for doing whatever it was that caused those feelings, if instead we take Lanchampa's words and go into our body before we've acted on those feelings, and feel them as fully as possible as energy, not as emotion so much as what is, what is the quality of energy that we translate as, for example, anger or sadness, or you know, one of the things that's coming up a great deal these days uh, for people, and I see it in the, the psychological literature, uh, there's a lot coming up about shame. And perhaps that's a result of, of how many uh, people have been, not just women, but also men, been sexually abused as, as children. And, and the natural thing is to feel like you're not good enough, that something's wrong with you. You're ashamed of having had these things happen to you. And we can be ashamed for a lot, of it, a lot of reasons. Good heavens, I've got plenty of reasons myself to be ashamed. Um, one of the things was when, when we were just moving to Rangoon, and we had arrived at very late hour and were delivered to our, our new house, which was furnished sort of. And <clears throat> my kids at the time were two and a half and, and about six months. He was, it was slightly less than two and a half, two, two, two years, five months and five months uh, old. And we had um, a bedroom for the kids and a bedroom for us. And in the middle of the night, at midnight, we heard the scream uh, from the, the dining room. All the floors were marble, by the way. So it was very hard surface and uh, lots of sound. And <clears throat> it was the two-year-old. And I was too terrified to get out of bed and go to him. My husband did. I found him under the table. Uh, and there was a, a um, it was a kind of a large, large, uh, what are they called? Chinchuk. Um, that, and kind of like a salamander there was under the table and I don't know if he touched it and it bit him. There was no obvious wound on him, 
Uh, it may just have frightened him. But I will never forget how bad I felt about not having the courage to get up and go to my child in distress. We can have lots of situations like that in our life. Um, and they stay with us until we begin to tune in and work with them. And, it, and again, I'm bringing this up because these kinds of things come up in Zazen. And if we are to fully awaken, they, they need to be open to and worked with. Otherwise, they're like a, a drag on, on our progress. They, they hinder our ability to truly be free. To be free is to be free of all of it. And we can be, we can be. It is possible. And you could do it. But it means walking into these feelings and feeling their energy. Don't bring them up if they're not there, that's not necessary. But sooner or later in Zazen, things will come up for us. And then, then it's important to become aware, to allow that awareness, to be curious, to be open, to work to understand. Because again, these things don't just come out of the blue. We're not bad people. We develop habit patterns as a result of our conditioning. And that can make us do or, or cause us to do <clears throat> things we'd rather not have done. But when we see through the conditioning and see through the, how it develops, see through it deeply enough, then there is freedom. Then it's interesting, courage, courage comes at this point in my life, but it's only because I've done all the work I've done. If I were to go back there <clears throat> now and hear my child scream at midnight in a very strange country, uh, I would bounce out of bed and go and grab him and, uh, and protect him. But that's because I worked through my own level of terror and my own level of dissociation around that terror. So we can become free of these things. And as we become free of these things, our practice deepens naturally. We begin to see through our assumed behavior patterns and become free of them and it is seeing seeing through them that brings about that freedom when i was <clears throat> had done a, a fair amount of work and i was uh, in a, a a store a grocery store on a sunday evening in rochester many many years ago and i was going through the checkout line and the checkout clerk was in a filthy mind state, very nasty, being nasty to, to the people that she was processing through for their purchases. And in the old days, I would have taken that hugely personally. I would have assumed that there was something wrong with me that she was acting like that. But I suddenly saw, wait a minute, it's not about me. It's about she, for whatever reason, is in an awful mind state and kind of spitting it out of, at people. Maybe she didn't get to do something really important for her because she had to work that night. Or maybe her husband or her boyfriend left and, and dumped on her. Uh, who knows what happened? It, it doesn't really matter. It was like a light bulb going on. I don't have to carry this anymore. I don't have to go through life assuming that, 
when people look cross-eyed at me, as my mother would say, um, it's not necessarily because of me. It might be because of them. This is not that I would deny that maybe uh, I, I take a good look at my behavior and, and see if there was something I'd done to trigger meaning, create a situation difficult or, or unpleasant for another person. But if it was simply that they were having a bad hair day and I happened to be walking in front of the firing range, um, it had nothing to do with whether I was good, bad, or indifferent. It just was what it was. And there was a tremendous amount of freedom in that. Another thing we can do when we feel ashamed is, is if, for example, or get angry. And often shame comes after anger when we blow up and then we feel ashamed of having done it. Um, I went through that one as well, a good deal of my life. Then when we, when we kind of take a look at the underpinnings of it and do what we can to apologize, to make things right, and to vow not to go through that kind of behavior again. That sets us in a very important and, uh, and powerful trajectory to begin to let go of that habit pattern that would have caused us to feel that way and to react that way. It can also help to do the repentance kata, which uh, it's, has various different wordings and various different temples, but basically it's, it is essentially that uh, over lifetimes, we have uh, indulged in our negative self-image or self-image and caused pain and suffering, and that we intend to not do that again. And that we intend also to do what we can to make amends for it, to own it, and uh, you know, if it's possible to apologize or whatever it is, that each situation is different, then, then to, to go for that. And that can lighten our hearts tremendously. A long time ago, this is back in the 1970s, and this is what triggered me to uh, start doing Zazen. I recognize now, and didn't recognize then, that the karma to be married to my husband at the time had ended. And I tried to make it work. And there's, it, it was like trying to uh, bake a cake without any, any ingredients. It, it just wasn't happening. And finally, I realized I better, I better leave because otherwise I was, I was in danger of having an affair and I did not want to do that to him. And unfortunately, being as immature as I was, I did not do it in a very nice way. I had the opportunity just a few years ago when we were all together on the occasion of my, of our grandsons, our younger grandson's college graduation. And I was able to, he came up to me and he said, I'm sorry, I was such a bad husband. And, and I said, you weren't. I said, I didn't realize what was going on until I got into Zen, but the karma to be married just wasn't there. And it, it, it has been, um, I am so tremendously sorry to have caused you and the kids so much pain. And somehow, it was said, by the way, in the full house of all the relatives, uh, including in presence of his, his current wife and my kids and his sister and her husband, And it was such a weight off. It was amazing. Just to be able to say, I, I did wrong. I'm so sorry. 
I wish I had not done it. You're a wonderful husband. There was no reason other than that the, the, the connection just wasn't there to be married anymore. So there are things that can be done to, to um, make a difference, make a positive difference. There may be some situations where there isn't something that can be done, but most of them there is. But the most important thing is our practice is about exploring our beingness, our, our way beyond the usual. And it has to happen wordlessly because words won't get there. But to explore our mind, to explore our way of being, to ponder, who are we? What's our reason for being? Who are we really? And of course, there are koans to, to help with this, but most of us coming to practice have our own uh, innate koan, which is, in my way of thinking of it, much more powerful. Whatever it is, keep questioning, keep being perplexed, keep exploring. In this way, gradually you'll become more and more aware of where you're caught and in seeing through those caught places, more and more free. And your innate compassion, your innate wisdom, your innate ability to be joyful, will be more and more readily revealed as that process goes on. Yes, it can be daunting. There are times when it can be quite painful. But as Achan Cha, the Thai forest master, once famously said, there are two kinds of suffering. One is, you know, when you cross your legs and it hurts and you're bored and, and stuff is coming up in your zazen. That's temporary suffering. And then there is the suffering of a life long living without the ability to do that or without the option to do that or whether, without the opportunity to do that, where we're just perpetuating suffering. At least when we're sitting on the cushion and our legs are hurting and we would rather be out doing something something else, much more pleasant, although there are the rare people who enjoy doing Zazen. Um, and we, we get to a point where we will eventually, if we persist. That's temporary. And as we stick with it, we will begin to get more free, little by little by little. It's funny, Harita Shodaro, she said, the first 10 years are really hard. The next 10 years are even harder. And then it gets joyful. I would say the first however many years are hard and, and, and the first basic period is difficult until you get a sense when you've had some success in letting go of some things, seeing things and letting them go and not being caught by them anymore, then it begins to be different. And it may not take 20 years for that to happen. Heavens, it's a long time. It may only take two or three or four, or maybe 10. But as it continues, it gets easier. And the practice, as I've said so many times, and this phrase kept me going when things were really, really difficult. First, it shows you where you're caught and then it sets you free. And I would add, if you're willing to stick it out and go through the show you're caught part, 
and not just bail at that point. This is a really important thing in Zen practice. And the other important thing is when you begin to see things, not to deny them, not to try to hide from them, not to try to turn your back on them, but to use them as incredible opportunities to become more free because then they will. And in this way, you're doing the long maturation that Tori Engie was so expressive about, and you're really doing Zen practice. You're not playing around anymore. You're beyond the honeymoon stage, and you're really making some progress and you rel realize as you're doing that, that there are going to be easy times and there are going to be difficult times in practice. But uh, when you recognize that that's just simply how it is, then the, the hard times are not as hard somehow. Bowden, who's my Dharma brother and the head of the Rochester Zen Center, Bowden Roshi, once told me a long time ago, he was uh, Kathar Roshi's attendant for a long time and including for an extended period in Mexico. And uh, Roshi Kaplow was a, you could say a workaholic. He also worked uh, with dedication on himself all the way through to the end of his life. But um, he had no working hours because it was like 24 seven. And when you're an attendant and you're young and you um, are asked to, you know, I'll, I'll give you an, an example of this. He's, he's, he's written a number of books, quite excellent books. And he always starts out with one sentence and he will write this one sentence by, with pencil or pen, hand you the paper. You're supposed to type up that one sentence, give it back to him. He'll turn it in, in, into two or four sentences. Give it back to you. You type it up again, and the, the process continues. And it continue, can continue until late at night. It can start early in the morning. We always did zazen twice a day. That was important. But there were no days off. I remember one time when we were, um, we were going to go shopping, and Roshi was also an inveterate shopper. And, and it was when we were in Mexico and he decided that he wouldn't go along because of, he wasn't feeling so well. He had, he had um, well, it turns out he had two different colonies of amoebas in him for a long term. And he also uh, was allergic to milk products. So you name it, that something was gonna get him. So he was often having tummy troubles. So this day he had tummy troubles and he wanted us to go ahead and uh, his two attendants to go ahead and, and do the shopping because we had to do food shopping. So we headed the 14 miles to Cuernavaca to do the shopping and joked all the way that we were having this amazing micro vacation. So first time uh, we weren't solidly working. But Bowden told me once he realized he didn't have any time of his own, it no longer mattered. I think the same thing may have happened with, uh, only a slightly different version of it, with Jacques Lusserand in Buchenwald. When he became so sick, he was dying and he <clears throat> simply tuned in to the full 100% experience of dying. And he described it in detail, but he survived. And not only did he survive, but he had a deep awakening experience as part of that. And after that, it was not a problem. Even though he was in Buchenwald, which was a notorious death camp, where there was death all around, people were being ritually executed or they were being taken to the showers and gassed, 
or they were being murdered by sadistic guards in the middle of the night or strangled by their fellow um, prisoners who'd gone berserk. And they were also being starved. And yet in the midst of that, he found joy. Because he'd let go of his need to be somebody else somewhere else. We have the same capacity. When we see the most profound truth, it is immensely liberating. And it's not an instant thing. We have to work for a long time to get there. But when we do, when we do all the work we need to do in order to open to that place of reality, true reality, it is phenomenal. And each of us is fully endowed with that capacity. And now we have before us six more days in which to explore in which to uh, uncover where we're caught and become freed in those places. So take advantage of it. We don't know when it'll come around again. I thank you for listening. I'll stop now and recite the four vows. to see where that oh that's a hand raise what happened to the there we go <laughs>